Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us. Uh, if, if we haven't met yet, my name is John. I have the great honor of being the campus pastor here at this location. And uh, we are in week six of this series, Flourish, where we've been looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to a church that's doing really well and seeing what we can learn from that church so that we can flourish. Um, and so I'm excited to dig into today's topic because it's a topic that you either maybe in your circle hear about too much or maybe you don't hear about it at all. Uh, it's an important topic as it relates to having a life of flourishing. Uh, it's an important topic because it can give us hope, it can give us encouragement, it can give us strength, it can give us focus, and it can give us peace. Um, overall, it's not a topic that probably for most of us, though, gets addressed on a regular basis, and there's a lot of confusion that can be around it. And, and so some of us have kind of said, you know what, I'm just not going to think about that. And as a result, I believe that there's a, an anemic hope that we have, and there's a lack of peace that God doesn't want us to experience. And so I'm excited to dig into this topic with you today. There's a lot of information about this topic. I got to tell you right out of the gate, we're not going to get to all of it. Some of you are going to be disappointed and say, oh, we didn't even cover this. We could talk about it in the lobby afterwards. Happy to answer any questions that I can in that time. Uh, but this is an important topic for all of us, and here's the topic the return of Jesus. We're talking about the second coming of Christ, Christ's return in victory to earth. So uh, let me just lay my cards out on the table for all of us as we get going here. I've been all over the map when it comes to this topic. Uh, growing up, the Left Behind series was pretty popular when I was somebody interested in reading. I don't know if you've ever read any of those books. Terrifying. You know, I was afraid that you know, Christ was going to come back, take all the good people, the good Christians with him, leave all the rest of us behind in you know, this kind of terrible mess. And so reading those, I remember hearing teachings on TV about how credit cards were the mark of the beast and how the Russian helicopters in the 80s were the locusts of Revelation 9. And so I heard that. And then I went to other churches and was in other circles where we never talked about this topic. It was almost as if Christmas was all there was, and you just live a good life, and everything was about the practicality, the focus of how do you live the best possible life here without thinking about how Christ is going to come back and redeem and renew and restore all things here. And so I'm excited to get into this, especially given all the study that I've put into this. When I got my Master's of Divinity, and when I went through the ordination process, a good portion of what I studied in those defenses and in those papers was this particular topic. And so... Again, I'm just letting you know, we're not going to get to everything today, but certainly at least it starts a conversation uh, that is important and significant for us if we're seeking a life of flourishing. I'm going to boil this whole topic down to this one phrase for you. Right? There's going to be a lot to cover, and so if you're tuning in and out, here's your lifeline. Here's the anchor to come back to over and over again. That we flourish when we live in light of Christ's return. That's how we flourish, is living in light of with the knowledge of, with the perspective of the return of Jesus. That's what we're going to seek to prove leads to a life of flourishing today in our time together. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll have the words on the screen, of course. But let me give you a little bit of background in case you're just joining us for the first time. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to a church that he got to start but didn't have a lot of time to help develop. He had a few weeks there, and then he was run out of town by the establishment. So he's on the run, and a few months later, he has this kind of quiet season, if there ever was a quiet season in the Apostle Paul's life, and he's able to send one of his co-workers to go check on this church. The co-worker's there. He gets the report. A few weeks or maybe months later, he comes back to the Apostle Paul with great news that they're doing well, they're standing firm, they're flourishing, but they've got some questions. One question in particular that they have relates to the grief that they're going through. So, since that time that Paul had left, some of the members of that church had died. And they were hoping that they wouldn't have to go through that experience. And so they're, they're asking the Apostle Paul, what happens to the people who have died when Christ returns? And when is he coming back? When is all this pain and this struggle and this angst, when is it going to be over and we just get to be with him? And so the Apostle Paul has to answer this question and address this idea of what happens to those who have passed away when Christ returns. And he's going to address this passage to that specific question. But there's going to be a lot in there for us today. So let's go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. 
Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve. Is that what it says? No. It says, so you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no, what's that word? Hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus all those who have fallen asleep with him. I want to pause here for a minute because it is important for us to know that when we lose loved ones in this life, that we are to grieve. I remember being probably 10 or 11 and uh, somebody at the church we were attending at the time had passed away and I, I didn't know the person particularly well, but we went to the funeral service with my family And I remember the person who was leading the service stood up in front of everybody and said, we know where this person is. They're with Jesus in glory. And so you shouldn't be crying. You shouldn't be sad. We should be celebrating. This should be a party because that person is in paradise. And as like a 10 or 11 or maybe a 12 year old, I remember thinking, I don't think that's right. You may believe that Our piety, our righteousness has to put a restraint on the grieving process, and it doesn't. Scripture over and over and over again gives us permission to grieve. Those tears are righteous, to bring that before God when we lose a loved one. It says that we are to grieve, but not to grieve like those who have no hope. You see, we've got a safety net that the rest of the world does not have came across a poem written a couple hundred years after Paul's writing to this church. And this is what it says. And I think that this very same poem would probably be passed around by certain people today in our world, divorced from a relationship with God. The sun can set and rise again. But once our brief light sets, there is one unending night to be slept through. That's the idea, right, in the world It's like, hey, eat and drink for tomorrow we die and maybe something good happens or maybe we just go into the ground. That idea has just become more and more prevalent and more and more popular in our world. And that's not what we believe. We do grieve. We do bleed in this life. But there's a safety net to catch us that is hope. And I would even tell you today that there's even hope for the people that we're like, we're not sure. All of us have probably gone to funerals or memorial services where it's like, I, I just don't know if that person had any heart for Jesus. And there's hope even in those situations. Why? Because there's this one passage in the Gospel of Luke, we're familiar with it, where there's a thief on the cross right next to Jesus, somebody who had broken God's law, who was a sinner, and spends a good part of the process of being crucified, mocking Jesus next to him. If you're the son of God, right, if you're who you say you are, then you should come down from the cross and rescue us as well. He's mocking Jesus for hours. And then all of a sudden, there's this moment of clarity at the end of his life. And he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say to him? You didn't live a good enough life. You came to that conclusion too late. You missed out on going to a life group. You didn't give in church. You never filled out a connect card. Does he say any of that? No, what does he say? He says, truly, I tell you the truth that today you will be with me in paradise. Friends, we have an amazing hope because the grace and the love of God is so big and so vast that even somebody who comes to the realization at the very last moments of their life will be welcomed by our Savior and coming King. Amen? Amen. And so, yes, grieve. The same Paul that writes this, he writes to the church in Rome, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you never cry. It means that you lean in and you know you have a safety net. Let's keep going. According to the Lord's word, this is verse 15. We tell you that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. What he's saying there is that those who have passed away will be first in line. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Now, 
Think about how public this sounds, right? It's not as if it's like quiet or not observable. Think about how much detail there is here about how visible and how public this is. For the Lord himself, not somebody else, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Edwin Diaz is going to play him in. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They will rise in life. After that, we who are still alive and who are left will be caught up in the Latin version of the New Testament. That word there for caught up, seized, is where we get the word that you may be familiar with, rapture. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5 says, Now, brothers and sisters in the faith, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, this is the cultural narrative. Everything's fine. Everything's good. We're on the right direction. Everything's okay. Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Heavy stuff. There's four questions I want to get into here for this section. But before I do, I want to just give us the big idea here, is that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back to fix what is broken in the universe, in the world, in our society, And even in our own bodies, all will be made right. It will be restored, renewed, and redeemed. That's important for us to know because Jesus does not lose. He doesn't surrender. He doesn't say, ah, you know, I really liked that place, but I guess I'm going to have to blow the whole thing up because I guess we lost that one. He doesn't surrender. He doesn't lose. He's coming back in victory to give us a body that no longer struggles, that no longer suffers, that no longer experiences decay and brokenness and inadequacy, to build a society where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, and to make sure that all of creation works exactly the way that it was always designed. He doesn't surrender, he wins. And we have to start there. That can give us hope, it can give us strength, it can give us focus, it can give us peace. That is what scripture clearly teaches. But we've got some questions, right? When? Sounds good. When's that going to happen? Well, I'm happy to tell you that after a lot of conversations at our teaching team meeting, we've studied commentaries, we've uh, gone down the line looking at articles and conferences, and we got our whiteboards out and mapped a whole bunch of things out, and at the end of all of that, we don't know. We don't know. I would even go so far to say that we can't know. Jesus says this when he's talking to his disciples about when all of this is going to play out. They're asking him, tell us when. And he's like, the angels don't even know, so you guys aren't going to know. Not even the son knows. It's for the father to know. So it's not that just we don't know. It's that we can't know. Whenever we try to find out information that we can't know, that gets us into trouble. We have to come back to this idea that if God wanted us to know, he would have told us because he loves us. And so that means that our life is better set when we don't know the exact day and time that he's coming back. Now, that doesn't stop people from trying. You think Jesus was pretty clear in that verse, like you will never know the right answer to this question. And yet I remember coming across a book this past week, 88 reasons why the rapture can happen in 1988. There was a follow-up book called Rapture Report, The Final Trumpet. Made some different calculations. You layer the Feast of Tabernacles over the Ezekiel Temple and combine that with the nine days in Daniel or whatever it is. And and then you extrapolate that using the sixes as ones and mapping things out with the Greek alphabet on a whiteboard. You look like a crazy person and you're wrong. Because you're seeking out something that Jesus says you will never find. It's always the human problem, right? It's what got us in trouble in the first place is wanting to know things that God says you don't need to know that. So if you find somebody, because our culture can be obsessed with this, thousands and thousands of videos on YouTube, but people trying to predict it, you ever encounter somebody who says, I know when Jesus is coming back, 
run the other direction and take everybody who's with you with you. Because this does damage. It seems innocent, right? Okay, so this person believes that Jesus is coming back on March 11th, 1988. What's the big deal? But to our society, when March 12th comes, look at these Christians. Look how foolish they are. Why would you believe what they believe? They can't even get when Jesus is coming back right, and we don't even agree that Jesus even lived. Don't listen to them. The damage. We've lost credibility in the world around us because for a while there, there were all these obsessions with predicting times and dates. And at the same time, it did damage for people within the church because people quit their jobs. They sold their houses. They pulled their kids out of school so they could all be together on this particular day when Jesus was gonna come back. And then he didn't. You don't think that that caused some people to just say, forget the whole thing. I bought into a lie. And they wrote off Jesus because somebody was telling them something that Jesus said was a complete lie. That's a real tragedy. So there's a lot at stake here. We cannot know when. So then, why hasn't he come back already? Right? Don't we wonder this? 2,000 years is a long time. He's telling everybody in the New Testament, soon, be ready, be watchful. And here we are all these years later, and it's like, things have been pretty bad at points throughout history. Like if you were picking a time to come back, there have been times that you could have come back. So why? I'm happy to tell you that after lots of conferences that we've watched and articles that we've read and discussions that we've had, we got out the whiteboard with all these commentaries end. We don't know. God has his own reasons for why he hasn't sent Christ to come and get us yet, to come and fix everything, to do everything that we see in this passage. And I know that might sound like a cop-out to some of us here, some of us who say, you know, it just sounds like you're just trying to take the easy way out, John. I don't know if I believe this, and so I think that that's just a, that's a cheap answer. But there's this passage in the book of Job. We're, we're probably all familiar with the book of Job and, and Job's story. Uh, he's somebody who loses everything with God's knowledge and just spends chapter after chapter being kind of berated passively, aggressively by some of his friends about how he must have done something to offend God, otherwise God never would have let bad things happen to good people. And Job continues to defend himself. He says, I just need an audience with God, and if I had a little bit of time, then I could go ahead and plead my case, and he would see that this isn't the way to go about things. And then in chapter 38, 38 chapters this goes on. That's why we have the phrase, that person has the patience of Job. He had to wait 38 chapters before God shows up. And God doesn't show up with answers. God shows up with questions. He shows up to Job and says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? What song were the angels singing when that happened? You were there, right? Sarcastic like crazy. And this goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter. What's God's point? You don't even know how the world works. How could you possibly know the best way to run it? Friends, I think that when we come to this and we all say, hey, it would be much better if God came back today or before the next election or before 2030 or pick whatever day, that that would be best. We have to humble ourselves and remember that there is an infinite amount of things that we do not know. We do not even know how the world really works and therefore we are not in a place to determine how to best run it, redeem it, renew it, or restore it. But that doesn't mean that God just says, just deal with it. He's given us an empty tomb that says that death will be defeated. He's given us his spirit within us to lead us into truth. He's given us the scriptures to tell us. He's given us his promises. And in light of all that, we have enough. We don't know when, we don't know why, but we have enough. Now some here may say, well, what if he doesn't come back by the time that I die? What if he doesn't come back in my lifetime? It's a good question, but I don't think that it's really one that matters in the grand scheme of things because the reality is there is a near 100% chance that everyone in this room will be dead in the next 100 years. Sorry to bum you out, but that's the reality. A hundred years, nobody's left in this room. For some of us, not 50 years. Some of us, not 20, and maybe a few of us, not 10. I say that as a reality because there's only two things that are going to happen. He's going to come back 
for us or we're going to go and meet him. That is the reality. And it's a definite thing that's going to happen. How it happens, whether I meet him or he comes here to meet me, it's going to happen. And so I need to be ready for that. Now, what can we say about what this day will be like? This day where he comes back. I get John, you can't say the date, and I get that there's some things that we can't answer about the mind of God, but what does this day actually look like? Well, there's two very opposite experiences for people on this particular day. But before we kind of unpack those, I just want to proceed that with this. This is an opportunity for humility. Let me just say that there are several very good views about how to explain all of this. And they're held by people who search the scriptures, who love God and who love others. And at the end of the day, the church has often just said, you know what, you disagree with me, even though you've got scripture to back it up, we can't be friends. And broken off and broken off and broken off. Did you know that within the Protestant idea, there are 47,000 denominations? 47,000. A lot of that is because simply we've lost this idea that God says be unified on the majors and you can be diversified on the minors. Within biblical bounds, we're not saying anything goes, but we're saying within what you can prove on scripture and you can stand on scripture, there can be diversity there. Because the cool reality is is that there will be a lot of people who when Christ returns, he doesn't return in the way they thought he would return. And yet they still get to be part of the party. Because it's by salvation, through grace alone, by faith alone. It's not your particular view on this. So this is an opportunity to practice humility. Even amongst our staff here, there's differing views on how all this plays out, how to best interpret this passage and other passages like it. So what can we say definitively then? Here's what we can say at Center Point Church. This is from our stance. It's on our, uh, our doctrinal statement on our About Us page. I'm going to just read it for you. We believe in the bodily resurrection of the saved and the lost, the eternal existence of all people, either in heaven or hell, in divine judgments, rewards, and punishments. There you have it. You didn't land in a position, yeah, because there's a plurality of views here that all have spiritual, biblical grounding. They line up with the rest of scripture. And so what we're gonna say is we're gonna focus on the big thing with humility, And then say, we might have to agree to disagree in some areas amongst ourselves, amongst ourselves as a church, but that's okay. Here's what we can say, though, that there's two definite experiences on the day that Christ returns. The first one we see in chapter 5. So let me read this to you again. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Destruction, this word in the original language, means utter ruin. Something that is no longer able to be used for the purpose that it was designed. Complete undoing. And it's something that you can't escape. Paul makes that very clear. Like that day, time's up. This is an unending existence without relationship. Now, these are, this is for, I want to be very clear, this experience is for the people who have no desire in their heart to be in relationship with God whatsoever. This is for the people who say, I'm my own king. I run the show. I don't need God. I don't want somebody telling me what to do. This is my life. These are my choices. I'm the king. I'm in charge. Doing that on an ongoing basis leads you to this path. Well, we say, well, why is that? How's that, how's that fair? It's because that is an existence, that is a destination without any of what's called common grace. There's this passage in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says uh, that God sends rain on the evil and the good, that he causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust, which means that God shows incredible amounts of goodness even to the people who want nothing to do with him. Things like warmth and light, friendship, Happiness, celebration, peace, satisfaction, rest, wholeness. All those experiences that anybody can tap into at different parts of their lives, that's a gift from God. And nobody has a right to lay claim to that for eternity when they don't want anything to do with the gift giver. 
And so I, I need us to see this morning that this is not God being mean. This is people who continually choose that they want nothing to do with God, and God ultimately says, have it your way. C.S. Lewis, the 20th century author and theologian, he said it this way. He said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. This is tough for us to understand because we don't like this idea and also because we think we're not that bad. But the reality is that all of us are born into this life thinking that the world should revolve around us, that we should be the center of the universe, that we should get whatever we want. We think we're born with a crown. You need to look no further than one of the aisles of Target, one of the toy aisles of Target around Christmas time. There's a small child throwing a tantrum, not mine this past year, thank God, because they want some kind of egg with a unicorn horn on it that costs $95 that is a stuffed animal in it that they're going to play with for five minutes and then never touch again. What is that? It says that the world revolves around me and we deceive ourselves if we think that just because we get taller and we get bigger words that we can use, that we grow out of that. No, we're born with this nature that says, I want to be in charge. I want the show to revolve around me. Now, I think some of us realize, all right, John, I'm a little bit more selfish probably than I should be. Sometimes I do this, sometimes I do that, so I get it. All right, I've got some, I've got some sin in my life, some brokenness in my life, but I'm not that bad of a person. We like to localize sin. We say, well, I haven't murdered anyone, as if that's God's standard, where he said, well, you didn't kill anybody, so get on in here. You know, like that's, that's not the way that it works. Sin is not something that is localized It's something that permeates everything that we do. It contaminates everything that we do, even the good things. If you're here today and maybe you think that by coming here, you're paying off something that you owe God, that idea doesn't work. It does not work. Friend, please hear me say that. Here's why. Even the good things that we do are contaminated by sin. It's not localized. It affects even the good things that we do. I saw this very clearly in 2019 around Thanksgiving. Two days before Thanksgiving, we get a positive coronavirus test in our our house. Not me. So I'm like, all right, caretaker mode. Taking care, we get another one drops. Long day of taking care of people and a lot of discomfort, as you well know. I go out to the garage at one point to put something away. And I'm like, man, I feel cold. But it's November, right? It's November, it's in the evening, of course you feel cold. And I feel tired, but of course you feel tired. You've been taking care of people all day. I said, you know what I'll do is I'll go inside. Once I put this away, I'm going to crack open a nice ice cold Pepsi and that'll help. Take a sip. Why is the Pepsi flat? It's not flat. You have coronavirus, John. The next few hours weren't fun, but there was a nice bright spot throughout the rest of that experience of being locked down during Thanksgiving with our family is that several people from the church came by and they dropped off chicken soup. I would love to tell you that it was delicious, but I couldn't taste anything for three months. I'm sure it was though. So uh, they made me chicken soup and my family, we were very grateful for that. Um, But think about this, what happens if when they came to drop off that chicken soup, I said, you know, that's so funny. I was just making you chicken noodle soup. You know, I was just kind of cutting up the chicken. Uh, I washed my hands, but it was after I cut up the chicken and the vegetables. And I did have my mask on while I was preparing the two times that I did sneeze. Not the third one though, but I'm sure it's fine. Here's a cup, take a sip. Nobody drinks that soup because it's contaminated. John, it was a good thing that you were doing, right? That person's not being mean by rejecting it. It's just you're giving them something that's poisoned. And so friends, our our good works do not fix anything. We are spiritually broken and we are spiritually broke. That is the state that if we don't change, we don't deviate from, that destruction awaits, ruin awaits That's where we were all going, and praise God, that's not where he left us. The scripture says in the very next chapter that God did not appoint us for wrath. He made a way through Jesus for us to have salvation, that Jesus died so that whether awake or asleep, we might live together with him. That is the good news of the gospel, and that means that this path that leads away from God and all of his goodness and relationship with him, unending, is only one option. There's another option. We call this one celebration. What does this look like? The Apostle Paul says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This picture of a great party. And Paul's saying, don't worry about those who have fallen asleep. They're going to be first in line in the welcoming committee. They're going to be at the head of the parade. You think about celebration, right? The Super Bowl was just last week. You see these people going nuts and bananas. Imagine that when Christ returns to fix everything. All of the shame and the pain, the sadness, being reunited with the brothers and sisters in the faith who have gone before, being part of this company and this great host of all believers across all times and in all places. What a party, what celebration in that moment. I think about some of the songs that I heard growing up in some of the churches that really talked about this a lot, how happy they were. You know, we used to sing when the saints go marching in. You can't sing that without a smile on your face. Think about songs that talk about soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the king. I'd have sung that just now, but I wasn't sure that some of you knew it. I didn't want to be standing up here alone. It's vulnerable enough. But these were the songs, and it was a reminder of what a great moment. You can't write a ballad about that moment. It's going to be such celebration and such joy because everything will be made right. And we can get so focused on the trees and miss the forest. I want us to think about that passage there. It says, we will be with the Lord forever. Not seeing as in a mirror dimly, amen. But seeing him face to face. Being known, being loved. You might have had moments in your walk with Christ where it just felt like, thank you, God. Imagine that unending. Imagine being free from sickness and weariness and pain and loss. Imagine being free to create and to enjoy and to worship. There's no time clock on that. There's no part of the party where everybody grabs their jackets and their keys and they leave. It never ends. What a beautiful picture here of this great parade and this great celebration that is a cause for us to have hope and have peace and to have strength and to have focus. This is what we need to come back to. We will be with the Lord forever. And friends, I would just say lovingly that if you're here and you hear about being with the Lord forever and it doesn't move you in your heart, you have to dig into that. Why? Why, if that is the defining relationship in my life, that this is the person I've given my life to, that I'm so grateful for, they rescued me from destruction and from bearing the judgment for my crimes, and they've given me life now and life forever. Why would I not be excited and looking forward to that moment? That's something to dig into. If that's not moving, I'm not talking about external expression. I'm talking about in your heart, if you hear, we will be with him forever and be like, hmm. You have to look into that. Please examine why that is the case. So what do we do with this? There's this beautiful moment, this great celebration coming where Christ will fix everything in creation, in our world, socially, in our bodies, redeem, renew, and restore everything. What do we do with this in a practical sense? I want to read you this last piece of scripture here as we close. This is from the uh, chapter 5, and this is verse 4 to verse 11 here. But you, brothers and sisters, pay attention here to all the times he talks about being and who you are and to whom you belong. Listen for those. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, unfocused, not paying attention, Let us be awake, focused, and sober, not given to excess, not being distracted by all the shiny objects in the world around us, not given to excess. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. He said, those people who are of that, they live in a way that lines up with that. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate to cover our hearts. And the hope of salvation is a helmet to protect our mind. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. 
Therefore, encourage, comfort one another and build one another up, strengthen one another, just as in fact you are doing. What Paul is saying here is not something to do, but a way to be. He's telling this church that who you love changes how you live. Who you love changes how you live. When I loved myself above all else and the defining relationship in my life was me, I lived in accordance to this. That's sleep and that's drunkenness and that's darkness and that's not being a children, being part of the children of light. When Christ became the defining relationship in my life and becomes the defining relationship in your life, it changes how we live. We're children of the day. This is who we are. We belong to him and we live in accordance with that. We have to stop being people who say, well, that seems like fun. We're going to be different. We're going to grieve different. We're going to talk different. We're going to respond to our enemies different. We're going to put politics in a different category differently than the world around us. We're going to think about money and about sex and about power differently because we're different people. Who we love has changed how we live. And so if we think about Christ's return, if we live in light of that, we will by nature just live differently. Because we are different. And we get into trouble when we're trying to have the best of both worlds. Say, well, when I'm in church, I'll be like this. And when I'm at work, I'll hide that. When I'm hanging out with my friends, I'll hide that. You are different. Because you love someone different. And that's going to change the way that you live. And so what that means is that when we're watching the news and we see all of this horrific stuff no other way to really put it. We see evil, we see injustice, we see death, we see exploitation, we see greed, we see corruption, we see incompetence, we see fear over and over again. When we see that, we have to remember that we live in light of Christ's return. I'm not saying we put our feet up, there's work to be done. Remember growing up hearing the phrase, you don't want to be too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. There's work to be done. We should be seeing righteousness and should be seeking that in the world around us. When we, when we have troubles in our marriage and we're struggling and, and when we've come to the point where we're so tired of being single that we're so frustrated, we're like, I'll just almost marry anybody at this point just to be done with this season. We have to live in light of Christ's return and we'll live differently. When we get a bad health report or somebody we love gets a bad health report, when we've lost somebody that we love, we have to live in light of Christ's return. Because yes, we grieve, but we grieve differently because we have hope. When we're so frustrated with ourselves because we've stumbled and fallen again, we failed our own standard, we look at the world around us and we say, how come it's so easy for them? How come I'm not like that? And we just get crushed into the ground We live in light of Christ's return. He is our coming king. He will restore, renew, redeem everything. That's creation. That's the world society in which we live. That's our very own bodies. He's coming to fix everything. And if we live in light of that truth, we will flourish. Let me pray for us. Christ, I thank you that you are our savior crucified risen and coming again. Praise you that you did not leave us. You didn't abandon us here. You love this creation and you don't lose. I pray that that would give us confidence in the world. A world that continually grows at odds with what we believe and how we are called to live. God, give, let it strengthen us. Let it comfort us in those seasons where it's hard, where it feels like the pros and cons are not balanced in our favor. Lord, let it give us hope when we're grieving, when we're hurting. Let it give us peace. God, let it lead us to give things the appropriate amount of attention. Maybe there's some of us that have to scale back because we've been engaging in a little bit of excess over here or excess over there and that's gotten us kind of drunk with the things of the world and we just need to be focused on you we thank you for all that you've done with us you brought us out of wrath because you took that judgment for us so we can look forward to a great celebration in that place where there's no more sickness and no more pain 
and no more hospitals. God, we thank you for that hope. We look forward to that day. We hold on to that day for every day in between now and then when we get to meet you and see you face to face. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen and amen.